WWOR-TV is the only New York area station to provide closed captioning of the local news. The closed captioning of tonight's news has been underwritten by PSENG. The power is in your hands. Can you feel it, baby? I can too. Better vibes tonight with Marky Mark. He was all apologies today with good reason. He's been under fire from civil rights groups. The rapper says he's sorry for past racist actions. Among them, he harassed some black kids, school kids, in 1986, and he was jailed five years ago for assaulting two Vietnamese men. The apology came as several groups protested in Times Square. Though they ultimately praised the rapper, they said the music industry needs to do more to end bias hatred. Artists have tremendous power in shaping the attitudes of young people. And in a time of increased violence against lesbians and gay men and people of color, it is essential that artists use their power to promote tolerance and understanding. Marky Mark's manager says the performer is going to make anti-bias public service announcements. At Rutgers University, it's not studying, but security that's now number one on many students' minds. Robert Miller reports. For a female on the campus of Rutgers University lately, there seems to be more to worry about than tough tests and failing grades. There have been four sexual assaults on the Rutgers campus in the past two weeks. There's a composite sketch of one suspect. The incidents don't seem to be related. Protective sprays have seen a sudden sales boost. Well, we carry maids all, all the time. We always walk together. We never go anywhere alone. I, I, particularly, I've been seeing a lot of police around at night. Um, when I walk around, there's police everywhere. The Do police. you feel safe, then? I feel safe to when extent, I... To an but extent, yeah. We try to get, like, um, rides home if we're walking home late at night and try to walk with people. Campus security is being increased, as it was about a year ago, during a similar rash of sexual assault. Are the campus cops doing enough? These things are always going to happen, but in the number that they're happening, I think that there should be something more that they can do. Rutgers spills over onto six communities with an open campus in an urban environment. Is there something about Rutgers that's more conducive to, to crime of that kind? I don't think so. Uh, uh, if you look at the statistics from major institutions of higher education around the country, everybody has basically the same kind of problems. I don't think it's something that's unique to Rutgers. So we checked, and he's right. For 1991, Rutgers in New Brunswick, with 33,000 students, had four rapes. In that same year, the University of Washington, with 35,000 students, had three. And USC, with 35,000 students, had four. And if you can believe Rutgers Sexual Assault Services Coordinator, there may be another factor in Rutgers' favor. I think this campus is different in that we acknowledge that sexual assaults occur and we try to address them and prevent them. That's Are you the saying that other schools do not? I don't think that schools across the country have, uh, as a whole, really acknowledged this problem. No, I don't think they do. The Rutgers Police Department has gotten approval to hire eight more officers. However, by the time they get them recruited and trained, they won't be on the job until next Christmas. In New Brunswick, Robert Miller, Channel 9 News. The case of the so-called Butcher of Avenue A is now in the hands of the jury. Dr. Abu Hayad is charged with performing illegal abortions. A woman claims Hayad ripped off the arm of her child during a botched abortion. In Indiana, an 18-month-old baby girl is okay after surviving at home on her own for four days. Police say her grandmother died of a stroke last weekend while taking care of her. The baby survived on cornflakes and potato chips. Now to a story of a brave man wrestling with a deadly disease. Here's Russ. Indeed, Brenda. Okay, last year at this time, almost to the day, I did a story on Julius D'Agostino, the wrestling coach for 30 years at Pearl River High School in New York. Known to his kids just as Coach Dag, he was stricken with cancer at the time and given only two months to live. We now bring you up to date on this very special man. Despite his cancer, Coach Dag remained strong last season, both in body and spirit. What I can go in a corner and drop dead or just lie down and not, you know, face it. And I'm facing up to it. That's reality. And that's what we try to teach kids. This is reality, guys. This is what it's all about. We have to be part of this and uh, you have to accept it. That's all. So Dad continued to coach his kids and at the same time fight his cancer. A year later, though, he's clearly losing the battle. The end is near, but the spirit hasn't changed one bit. You know, you don't go out in the middle of a ball game and quit. You uh, suck it up, 
and you come back and you try to be strong before it. And that's what we're trying to do. He's really been like, uh, the only way I could really describe it would be like the ultimate coach. I mean, he's, he's been there for me, like in the room and, uh, you know, outside the room, emotional help, you know, I mean, physical, mental, everything. He just, he's the ultimate coach. Coach Dagg has played a major role in shaping the life of Phil Donnelly. He's coached the kid since he was in grade school. Last year, Phil wanted to give Dagg a state championship, but instead finished fourth. In two weeks, he tries to do it again. Only this time, Phil knows there won't be a next time for his coach. Whether, you know, I uh, win it, you know, come away with a second, third, or don't even place at all, you know, that's just an outcome. I don't really look at, you know, that stuff as like, you know, I try not to think about that when I think about Dag in the same thought, you know what I mean? Here we are again. What would him being the state champion this year mean to you? Well, I guess, I guess uh, from the, uh, fulfillment of our, uh, our dream, I've had him since he's been five years old. So um, he's the type of kid that uh, has worked hard. And he's the type of kid that should be rewarded for it. And I think uh, he's really focused on it this year. If you could leave the kids with the legacy of Dag, what do you think that would be? Um, well, like I said last year, uh, a guy that tries to give his best, uh, tries to show that uh, athletics is a very important part in life, and you try to lead a, um, a life of... Uh, Dedication to the kids, uh, dedication to your family, and uh, above all, the dedication to the people that you work with. Coach Dagg will be flown up to Syracuse on March 6th to watch Phil Donnelly go after that state title. We wish them both the very best. I'll see you later in sports with tonight's highlights. Profound story. Oh, yeah. Terrific guy. Check in with Lloyd now. What do you have coming up in the weather? Well, thank you very much, Roland. We have a bitterly cold night underway. Let me show you how bad it is. I mean, it is really getting down there. The chill factor is 8 below now. The temperature's 21, but with that north wind of 20, it feels like 8 below in a rising barometer. We have Arctic air invading the area. Also, a major storm developing out west that will affect us a little over the weekend. When will it snow and how much? Lloyd Lindsay Young, hello, and all the details coming at you later on. Roland and Brendan. All right, parents, stay tuned, because coming up, we'll tell you about a crib that could be dangerous. Also tonight, don't eat another piece of fish before you've seen tonight's I-Team report. And then screen star Michael Douglas tells us what it's like to do those steamy sex scenes. Coming up. She manipulates people. Freeze! How much did she... In the beginning, then I got to like what he did for me. Channel 9 News is brought to you by American Airlines, something special to Europe. The homeless, we see them on the streets, we hear reports about what's being done to help them, and more often what's not being done. Our Chuck Gomez went undercover this week to try to get a better idea of what life is really like for those who have no home and nowhere to turn. Tonight, part two of his odyssey. New York just think that the homeless people are, are, the, are, the, are the traditional barry drums or the people who they see on the train all the time. Those are not the majority of the homeless people. You think these guys, you think these people give a f about us? To be homeless is to be ignored. A world where commuters don't meet your eyes even when you open the door for them. A world where frustrations spark anger and outrage. That's in the me like who is you? Big with a hidden camera, my photographer, Paul Sackles, and I became some of these invisible people. I felt the disgust of others. I experienced a sense of desperation, of sadness, of fear. And like other homeless people, I wondered where we'd spend the night. Many homeless told us anywhere but a shelter. So you won't stay at the shelters? No, I don't want no shelters. No, I'd rather, I'd rather stay in the doorway. Oh, you're a 
all right. As long as you got a buddy, nobody will bother you. But will they? This is the Sumner Avenue Armory in Bed-Stuy, a place as imposing as a fortress. The city provides 7,400 shelter beds each night, 6,000 for men, 1,400 for women. A state judge recently ordered that the city reduce the homeless population at the Sumner Avenue Armory and at the Franklin Avenue shelter in the Bronx. Homeless advocates say that shelters are breeding grounds for crime and are improperly supervised. That is perhaps why so many homeless people prefer the streets instead. The lack of good policing inside of the shelter that allow drug trafficking going on inside of the shelter. The fact that inside of the shelter, the amount of people that are there are too many in order to provide safety net for everybody. Back at Grand Central on my way to a shelter, I encounter two homeless men in a cold and musty quarter. One offers a lesson in survival. I make much money. I don't make no money. I just keep a dollar roll. If you sell me that jacket for two dollars, and I sell it to him for five, that's the profit on my cigarettes. I don't get nothing out of this. On the subway now for a trip to the Franklin Avenue Armory. For many of the homeless, a trip to the shelter is a nightly ritual. What happens? You, you go through the process there and they just sort of sit on you on a bus to the shelter? Is that what happens? Yeah, around about 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock, maybe one thirty, two 2 o'clock. They'll have a uh, series of buses go to uh, open beds in the system. On another platform, the train that will take us to our final destination arrives. It is the Franklin Avenue Armory in one of the toughest sections of the Bronx. I got through security and underwent a cursory interview. Then I was assigned a cot for the night. I was one of several hundred men packed into a room roughly the size of a football field. I walked around without being stopped. I saw only one guard making rounds. The stench of urine and unwashed bodies was almost unbearable. During our stay here, one homeless man offered to sell us some crack. Mr. Casillo, last night uh, I went undercover at the uh, Franklin Avenue Armory, and what I experienced was a situation where at one point someone offered uh, to sell my cameraman and I some crack, and there seemed to be continuing problems in terms of the number of policing guards for so many men. Mm. What's being done about that, and what do you? What's your response to what we what we saw? This, we work with a very hard to serve population. Uh, it's no secret that uh, that there are large numbers of of homeless folks who are unfortunately uh, stricken with substance abuse, chemical dependency problems. What we need to do is we need to uh, come up with more resources in order to ad address those needs. I could only begin to understand the needs of the homeless. My steps would ultimately take me home. For the homeless, the journey is far from over. Chuck Gomez, Channel 9 News. A tabloid TV show claims it's got astounding news about the Amy Fisher case. The guy who secretly taped Fisher lusting for a Ferrari is talking again. He says Mary Jo Botafuco talked to Amy Fisher on the phone the day before she was shot. A hard copy story to air tomorrow claims Mary Jo Fisher said, I know you who you are and you better stop bothering my husband. Mary Jo's attorney says the story is baloney. Coming up on Channel 9 News, commuters get ready for the latest shots in the border war. Why it may cost you more to go to work. And then, Brenda, close one eye because we have bikinis and more bikinis. A February beach party in the middle of Manhattan. Channel 9 News is brought to you by the new Dodge, a division of the Chrysler Corporation. Now look at tonight's top stories. Channel 9 has learned exclusively that a deal is in the works to keep David Letterman's show in New York at the Ed Sullivan Theater. The Haitian soldier who hijacked a U.S. missionary group's plane from Haiti to Miami surrendered tonight upon landing. And not guilty is the verdict for Earl Hill, the Trenton cop videotaped hitting a suspect. This next story is important for parents. Some portable cribs are potential death traps and you should stop using them. They are the Play School Travel Light Cribs, model numbers 77101 and 77103, made between 1990 and 1992. The government says three infants suffocated in the cribs. You can call 1-800-453-7673 to arrange for the crib to be picked up. 
Commuters take cover. More pot shots tonight in the New York-New Jersey border war. Two New Jersey lawmakers are launching a new tax offensive. They want more money from New Yorkers who cross into the Garden State to work. They say it's only fair since New York overtaxes New Jersey commuters. And now a story you won't see anywhere else. An environmental nightmare is emerging along the Jersey Shore tonight. It threatens the food we eat and the livelihood of those who depend on the sea. The I-Team's Joe Collum has an exclusive report. It's an ominous day at Belfort Inlet. The lifeblood of a crab fisherman goes up in smoke. Someone's just lost their whole boat. And with the crabbing industry now, how are they supposed to make a living now? On one hand, the fire is a singular tragedy. But it's also just the latest in a growing litany of signs that a way of life in this century-old fishing port may be about to end forever. I don't know what else is uh, left to do yet. We're still fighting them, but uh, like I say, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. Though this seems to be from another time and place, it is not. Belford is a port on the Jersey Shore, an eye shot from New York City. And to find the poison that may someday soon destroy their industry, fishermen need only look north across the Raritan Bay. This is where the problem began, in this burnout shell of a building on the banks of the Passaic River in Newark, New Jersey. This is where, for more than two decades, the dreaded defoliant Agent Orange was manufactured. Most of that chemical ended up being sprayed onto the jungles of Vietnam, but not all of it. Some of it is still with us here today. And even after all these years, it may still be destroying lives. Dioxin is a nightmarish byproduct of Agent Orange. It's been blamed for cancers and genetic defects in thousands of Vietnam veterans. Dioxin is treacherous in the smallest of doses. For instance, all the Agent Orange sprayed on Vietnam contained only 100 pounds of dioxin. Yet here at the old Diamond Shamrock plant, eight pounds of dioxin was released over a 25-year period into the Passaic River. And from there, it ended up in Newark Bay. And that's an incredible amount. That's the biggest single discharge of dioxin, I think, that's been recorded in the United States. Is that right? Yeah, it's really a very large amount. At Ramapo College in northern New Jersey, biologist Dr. Angela Cristini has made an alarming discovery. In a state-funded study of crabs in Newark Bay, she found dioxin levels of 940 parts per trillion, nearly 40 times above federal safety levels. Fortunately, Newark Bay is not a commercial fishery, but that makes what Christini found to the south in Raritan Bay even more startling. Dioxin levels in crabs of 80, 90, up to 200 parts per trillion, three to eight times above federal safety limits. Raritan Bay is a commercial fishery. The implications, they're, it's horrible. I was really shocked when I, I did not expect to find elevated levels in any of the tissues and crabs from Raritan Bay. And, and that's really, I think, profoundly disturbing to me because it says to me that the, the dioxin contamination has moved from Newark Bay and is now coming down and contaminating the sediments of Raritan Bay. Christini's findings are so new, most fishermen still don't know about them. Those who do give a dire forecast. I think you can predict uh, the crash of the uh, crab industry and, the, and possibly the lobster industry, since they are very similar feeding and uh, breeding habits, uh, you know, in the, in the Raritan Bay region. The Christini study may be the final nail in the coffin of an industry already bracing itself for death by dioxin. They're going to close this area right down to crabbing, which will just put everybody out of business here. For three years, the New York, New Jersey Port Authority has been trying to float a plan to dredge silt from cargo ship berths in the port of Newark. Shippers are diverting cargo from Newark to other American ports because berths here aren't deep enough. This port generates 180,000 jobs, roughly uh, $20 billion 
contribution to the regional economy every year. So yes, it's being impacted right now. The economy and the job situation is being impacted right now. The Port Authority wants to deepen the shipping berths from 36 to 42 feet. But the problem is dioxin. It's in the silt. And the Port Authority wants to drop it at the mud dump just six miles off the Jersey Shore. We're talking about a total um, tonnage of upwards of 200,000 tons of material in which the total amount of dioxin is about an ounce. The Port Authority maintains fish will not be contaminated, but environmentalists are not buying it. This is barbaric, and you are running with perhaps one of the most dangerous experiments ever off the Jersey coast. Many here still have vivid memories of the environmental disaster of 1988, when the Jersey Shore was inundated with medical waste and pollution. For them, dioxin dumping is like a bad dream all over again. It is a giant step backward. The fish will be uh, affected, the whole food chain will be affected, people stop coming down to the shore, and it's going to be uh, devastating like it was, uh, you know, years ago. But none are more fatalistic about the dioxin threat than the fishermen. Well, we have no other trade to do because when they, they shut that down out there, they'll shut the bay down. That'll be the end of the crabbing in the winter, too. And uh, no doubt it'll probably hurt the clamming, too. That'll kill that industry. Bob Best has been fishing for lobster and crab out of Belford Inlet for 35 years. But he just sold one of his boats and is about to sell the other and grudgingly give up a way of life he thinks has already been doomed by dioxin. For human beings, you know, we have a right to live and a right to work, you know. We don't want to go on welfare or anything, you know. We want to go out and make our own living, you know. Give us a break, you know. Joe Collum, Channel 9 IP. Fishermen got some good news late today when the government ordered the Port Authority to perform new dioxin tests before it dredges. As for the threat to human health, so far no tests have been performed to measure human contamination from the crabs. Experts say if you do eat crab taken from local waters, make sure it is not cooked in its shell. Coming up on Channel 9 News, the Islanders hit the ice to try to beat the Blues. Then a sure cure for the winter blahs. Bikinis coming up. <laughs> Somalia tops our news from around the world tonight. Canadian forces killed one Somali and wounded three others today. The shooting began at a demonstration when Klan members demanding more relief aid started throwing stones. In Germany, nuclear pirates caught red-handed. The black market theft and sale of low-grade uranium and plutonium is a growing problem. Most of the radioactive material is smuggled in from the former Soviet Union. Now news from around the nation. Here's Nine Watch. Detroit. The couple that left seven young children alone in a home that caught fire are in custody and may face charges. Grief-stricken Eudis Brave Boy's grandson, Mark, was one of the victims. Oh, God! You just don't leave small kids in the house by themselves like that. Somebody in the neighborhood will watch your child while you go to the store. Yeah. How the hell did she go to the store and came back with nothing? Security bars kept the kids from escaping the fire. Fort Lauderdale, cops bust five alleged members of the Bonanno crime family. The charges include racketeering, marijuana trafficking, illegal gambling, credit card fraud, bribery, and loan sharking. Seattle, Boeing says it'll lay off 20 to 25,000 workers. The aircraft maker says they are not needed because of production cuts. Happy birthday, Miami, baby Sasha celebrates her first birthday. She weighed less than a pound when she was born 18 weeks premature last year. Despite a slew of early medical problems, doctors say she's doing just fine. Whitney Houston outdoes Elvis. Her hit song, I Will Always Love You, has been number one for 14 weeks. The last group to hold the record was Boys to Men at 13 weeks, and before that it was Elvis in the 50s. Michael Douglas stars in a new movie that is bound to stir controversy. He plays an unemployed white-collar worker who goes on a rampage. Pat Collins talks to the actor about his new movie, Falling Down. Michael Douglas has that uncanny ability to pick movies that grab the public's attention. First, he produced One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, then starred in China Syndrome, and the list goes on. So where's your wife? Where's my wife? 
Michael Douglas explored revenge and sex in Fatal Attraction and 80s greed in Wall Street. For the 90s, Douglas has scored again with Falling Down, a dark comedy that taps into the dying American dream. The economy making you tense? Afraid to walk the streets? Life in the 90s got you down? Yeah, I think it's an issue uh, that's right there in, in front of us, which is basically who to get angry at, uh, and the one thing about the Cold War when it was going on is you had an enemy, you know, you had the Ruskies. And now for a lot of people, they don't know things aren't going right. There's a lot of people out there who um, have followed the process net. They've worked hard their entire life. They try to take care of their families and provide. And it's not working out. And they're angry. Douglas plays an L.A. defense worker fired from his job whose anger turns violent. I am not a vigilante. Just standing up for my rights as a consumer. I, I'd like some breakfast. We stop serving breakfast at 11.30. Have you ever heard the expression, the customer is always right? Yeah, well, hey, I'm really sorry. Yeah. Well, hey, I'm really sorry, too. Where did the look come from? Actually, I was still sort of struggling with it in the day of shooting about the hair. and So I knew it was short. But um, the hairdresser, and you have to trust everybody, she had an idea about the buzz, the flat top, and I said, let's go for it. The look is important. And I was thinking for basic instinct. Again, you were concerned about how you looked, and you lost a lot of weight. First of all, vanity was the most important. You had some sex scenes where you had to take your clothes off. So that seemed to be an important uh, aspect of it. But in, in basic, it was, it was a lean, you know, hungry uh, uh, look. Would there be an, a sequel to Basic Instinct? Uh, not that I'm involved in. They may. I mean, they mm -hmm. may very well do one. It would make a lot of sense for Sharon Stone on Basic mm -hmm. and her character to do one. But I can't see doing it. Tomorrow night, part two of our interview with Michael Douglas and more scenes from his controversial new movie, Falling Down. I'm Pat Collins, Channel 9 News. And Russ is here now with more sports. Okie dokie, tonight we've got Bruce Cosler getting another year with the Jets and the Islanders getting the uh, Blues at the Nassau Coliseum. Russ is looking for action tonight, is that what you said, or what? No, he says we're leading, oh, with, leading action. with action. I, I don't think Mr. Salzberg would appreciate that <laughs> remark. Anyway, only one local team in action tonight. Let's get to it on the ice at the Nassau Coliseum. Islanders facing off against the St. Louis Blues. First three we go from right wing. Igor Korolev lets it rip. Mark Fitzpatrick makes the stop, but Bob Basson catches in the rebound. one nothing Blues. Stay that way until 9.02 of period two. Watch the pretty pass from Stevie Thomas to Pierre Turgeon. Getting it over to Derek King, parked in front. Pass, Guy Ebert, game tied at one. Third period now, get a load of this goal. Brett Hull, loads and fires. High off the glass with the puck bouncing over the net, off the back of Fitzy, in the net to make it 2-1 Blues. However, the Isles answer, oh, about nine minutes later, digging hard behind the net, Benoit, Benny the Boy hold. Out to Brian Mullen with a one time, a game tied at a deuce. But less than two minutes to play. Karlov skating with the puck, lets it rip. Kevin Miller then gets it over to Ron Sutter in close range. 3 2 Blues. Then with the Isles desperate to tie, they pull the goalie. Jeff Brown gets the empty netter. 4 2 Blues the final at the Nassau Coliseum. Meanwhile, Pittsburgh tonight, the great. Red Wing, Gordie Howe, honored before the game for his contribution to hockey. A glass penguin, the gift, he almost drops it. Gordie also dropped a few players in his heyday. Now to the action. First period, Penn's Oilers, Jeremy Yeager. The slick pass in front to Kevin Stevens. Number 44 for Stevens, one nothing Penn. Second period we go now. Stevens this time sends the puck around back to Ron Francis. Out to Joey Mullen, who gets it past Bill Ramford to make it 2 0 Penn. But they couldn't hold the lead in this one. Oilers came back to win it by the score of 5 4. And one other hockey note here, not a good one for Ranger, Fran uh, Ranger fans, I should say. Center Darren Turcott will be sidelined three weeks with a hairline fracture in his left foot. All right, from the ice, what do you say we now move on to the hardwood in Phoenix tonight? Suns looking to scorch. 
right there. First quarter we go. Dan Marley missing from three, but Charles Barkley battled underneath. Slams two down a hat. 29-20 the Suns. Here come the Suns again. Danny Ainge, two. Danny Marley. This time Marley doesn't miss. 43-40. Suns scored into mission 74-55 over the Atlanta Hawks. All right, from the pros, let's now move on to the College Hardwood in Minneapolis, where the Minnesota Golden Gophers were home against the Badgers of Wisconsin, coached by former Nick, head coach Stu Jackson. First half, Gophers on a run. Ariel McDonald will get it ahead to Nate Tubbs. Up and in it goes. Gophers by 4-14-10. Then here to close out the first half, Boshin Leonard from three makes the rainbow connection. 40-28, Minnesota leads at intermission. Second half we go now, Boshin again, this time with the twisting motion inside, up and in, 67-55, Gophers for the game. Boshin with the motion, Leonard would have himself 23 points. Here he gets the kind bounce from the baseline, the final, Minnesota 85, Wisconsin 71. And here's one other score for you, 23rd ranked Virginia over 7th ranked Duke tonight, 58-55. Virginia also beat Duke earlier this season, making it the first time since 1990 that Duke has been swept by an ACC opponent. And finally, moving on to some gridiron business now, the Jets were a major disappointment last season, finishing with the record of 4-12. But that didn't stop the Jets from giving Coach Bruce Coslett a one-year contract extension today, which now runs through 94. After going 6 and 10 in 1990, Jets improved to 8 and 8 in 91, also qualified for a playoff spot, but then collapsed with a 4 and 12 in 92. Under Coslett's three years as head coach, the Jets own a record of 18 wins and 30 losses. Hopefully, they will be better next time around. Have to believe that. Mm -hmm. Coming up on Channel 9 News, a hot time in town, why the beach came to the big city. And then Lloyd with Old Man Witter. Oh, it's getting old. A hot time in town? Just the opposite tonight. Maybe a snowy time in town for the weekend. I'll be right over. Well, last night you said it was going to be colder than a well digger's boot, if I recall. <laughs> I, I said that. And uh, that well digger has frozen tootsies right now. It is horrendously cold. It's going to get worse. Here's our current conditions. Right now, 21. The chill factor is negative 8. Feels like 8 below. Kind of a tough night to drive around with no heater like Brenda's going to do. 30.07 and rising. Her, she drives these modern new cars, though. You can't trust them. Good evening, everybody. Hello, Palisades Park. Palisades Park. That's fun to say that. Got a, uh, an unusual name here. I hope I pronounce this right. Happy birthday to Meheran Sepjian. Something like that. I'm close, but no cigar, I guess. Snow showers occurring in the Great Lakes area. South of Buffalo, they had 15 inches of snow today. Hard to believe. Uh, you know, uh, just to the south of the city, but right in Buffalo itself, just an inch. You talk about cold. Whew, look at these. Six below Columbus, Ohio. Below at Springfield, Illinois. You know something? You want to go down to Miami and warm up? Forget about it. Only in the 60s tomorrow. Northern Florida down into the 30s tonight. Although the warm spot in the nation today was 80 at uh, Clearwater uh, on the west coast, 80 degrees. All right, one inch of snow at Pelston, Michigan. Meanwhile, heavy action in the west. Heavy snow. Hello, Los Angeles. More rain. Sandbagging efforts underway, almost two inches of rain in the L.A. Basin. I'll tell you what, they have had one of the most miserable wet winter seasons. That's the bad news. The good news, the drought is over uh, in California. There are just tremendous amounts of precipitation. Heavy snow in the Sierra. National low, 34 below at Butte, Montana. All right, radar, snow flurries uh, and snow squalls along the Great Lakes. Bitterly cold air coming in. Meanwhile, all the precipitation out on the West Coast, and yeah, we have a cold one tonight, as cold as zero in northwestern New Jersey, with chill factors well below. All right, here's my forecast on this Thursday night. Here it is, very cold, 14 above in the city, 5 to 10 above in the suburbs. Tomorrow, continued very cold, breezy, highs in the 20s, the chill factor 10 above. Tomorrow night, not quite as bad, teens everywhere. 
Now, we are expecting moisture to work up from the south over the weekend. Light snow on Saturday, moderate snow on Sunday, maybe mixing in with freezing rain. A little too early to call, but maybe two, three, four inches, something like that. We'll update it all again, of course, tomorrow, but uh, not a major snowstorm, but this is more of a traditional winter, snow cold. You know, not like these last sissy years. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lloyd. Bitter cold, possible snow, just the weather for swimsuits and volleyball. The Association of Volleyball Professionals and a bikini modeling team gave us a look at the things to come today. A few volleys and a preview of some hot beach wear at the South Street Seaport. Can summer really be four months away? I wonder what they're wearing in their feet, because that sand gets hot. <laughs> Like those outfits, did you? I did. I admit it. <laughs> That's it for us tonight. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for the news at noon with Sarah Lee Kessler. I'm Brenda Blackman. And I'm Roland Smith. We'll all be back tomorrow night at 10. We hope that you're here, too. Thanks for joining us. Good night. I should...